Hey guys, this is Craven Glacio with AC Service Tech, and today what we're going over is can you check the refrigerant charge by just reading the high side pressure of an air conditioning system or the low side pressure of an air conditioning system, or maybe even just monitoring both pressures of the air conditioning system without taking any temperature readings. If you want to learn more about checking the refrigerant charge, we have a full book out on all the procedures for preparing a system for refrigerant, checking the refrigerant charge, and also troubleshooting. We have this book available over at acservicetech.com. So I've had a lot of questions come in in reference to this is they're seeing other technicians just checking the refrigerant charge based on the low side gauge. Other ones are, are noticing other technicians checking the refrigerant charge using the high side gauge. So I just wanted to say that these are basically just rules of thumb in order to get you kind of close to the refrigerant charge level. It doesn't mean it's going to be an accurate refrigerant charge. It doesn't mean that the compressor is going to be safe because the compressor needs to have vapor refrigerant entering back in. It can't have liquid refrigerant or saturated refrigerant heading back into the compressor because that's going to damage it. So the normal range of what technicians are normally seeing on this low side gauge is about 58 PSIG, so right about here, up to about 85 PSIG depending on the indoor wet bulb temperature, the outdoor dry bulb temperature, and then also the, the pressure on the high side gauge. So that does not mean that you would want to set it somewhere in the middle there based on say the outdoor temperature. There's very, very bad issues that come with that. Uh, and once again, they have to do with system life. You know, if you're having saturated refrigerant enter into the compressor, you're gonna kill it. So that could create very bad situations for the compressor and for the, the homeowner or the building owner because you don't know if the system's operating correctly. You don't know if you're overcharging the system. To give you an example is for a system with a a TXV such as this right here if you were trying to set it at a certain pressure so say right now we have a, a pressure of about 70 PSIG if we bring that into the green saturated temperature in a ring it reads 40 degrees the 40 degrees is at the indoor evaporator coil so what we do is we read the temperature on the outer line right here the vapor line and we read 55 degrees so we got 55 minus 40 degrees and we have 15 degrees of superheat so right now we're at 54 so 14 to 15 degrees of superheat the issue is the TXV is controlling the superheat so if we're trying to raise the pressure here by adding refrigerant it's not going to help all that's going to happen is our high side pressure is going to increase because our refrigerant is basically going to get stored in the outdoor condenser coil this TXV is not going to allow this pressure to rise so you can't just target a certain pressure over here on the low side gauge because this TXV is controlling how much refrigerant enters into that indoor evaporator coil. So for R410A the normal pressures are say 102 PSIG up to about 145 PSIG and, and that's just due to the actual temperature inside the building uh, and the heat load in there and the issue with this is trying to set it for some some uh, pressure in the middle there is you don't know what the indoor wet bulb temperature is unless you measure it so if you don't know what the real heat load is inside the building then you don't know what pressure actually the saturated temperature and actually hits the total superheat to set this thing at so it's just a guess at that point and if you're guessing the system may have a problem with saturated refrigerant entering that compressor. The other thing is you may have overcharged this system and when you overcharge it, it's just leading to very bad electrical efficiency. The other thing is if you overcharge a system, it's not going to be able to remove the heat out of the refrigerant at the outdoor unit effectively. So it's, it's really you're lowering the capacity of the unit if you have a piston you need to read the indoor wet bulb temperature and the outdoor dry bulb temperature and you put that onto a target superheat chart in order to determine what the superheat should be and out here we're reading what the total superheat is and our total superheat right now on this line 55 minus 40 degrees and we have 14 degrees of superheat so you would have to compare your target superheat on a chart or an app or a digital gauge set to what you actually have so if your superheat was too high, then you would need to add refrigerant if you had a system with a piston. And if your superheat was too low, then you would have to recover a little bit of refrigerant. 
Another example is if you tried to set this outdoor pressure at a certain part. The, the issue is this high side pressure may be higher if these fins are deteriorated or if this is a lower sear unit that's a seasonal energy efficiency rating if, if the, the size of the coils out here is smaller, it's going to have a low sear rating, it's going to have a higher pressure. So you can't just set, set these at a certain pressure based on your prior experience. So it re you really need to check your sub coiling on this gauge and with this line. So let's just check that right now. Our sub coiling we have, it looks to be 175 PSIG. We bring it into the green inner ring because this is an R22 system. It's not an r 4 i R4 today is the pink inner ring. So this is R22, so we bring our 175 into our 92 degrees for the green saturated temperature in the middle of this condenser coil, 92 minus 83, and we're left with nine degrees of subcoin. So this is the temperature on the outer line. It's the small liquid line, and subcoin is the temperature decrease in liquid form of the refrigerant. So in this outdoor condenser coil, you have a saturated temperature of 92 degrees, and right when it turns into a liquid, it's still 92 degrees, and then as it moves through this outdoor condenser coil, it's rejecting heat, and then it comes out through this line and through the service valve as a high pressure, high temperature liquid refrigerant, and it's 83 degrees, so it lowers in temperature. We need to know this subcoiling to see if this system is overcharged or not. If you don't check the subcoiling, you're not going to know if that system's overcharged. The other big thing about all this is troubleshooting. If you're trying to troubleshoot a unit, say the the saturated temperatures are not working right, you know, you're, you're trying to add refrigerant or, or the system is at a very low pressure and it's just not rising on the low side, you may have a liquid line restriction, you may have a low airflow problem. You need to be able to read the total superheat here and on this line and the sub on this high side gauge and on this line. A very low pressure on this side could be an indication of either a low refrigerant charge, low airflow, or liquid line restriction. So you need to know uh, what the combination of total superheat and sub is to determine which of those three problems it is. Now you can determine this before even adding any refrigerant whatsoever. A low refrigerant charge is always a high superheat and a low sub -coin. A liquid line restriction is a high superheat and a normal to high subcoin. And a low airflow problem is a very low superheat and then a usually about a normal subcoin on this side. It's going to depend on the metering device as well. So I have all this laid out in the book. In the book we go over all the different troubleshooting scenarios and then we also go over depending on what metering device you have. So in this book, we, we go over a lot of different scenarios and the total superheat and the subcoin readings. We go over just checking the refrigerant charge level, the undercharge and overcharge scenarios, and we go over preparing a system for refrigerant, the different procedures that we use step by step in the field. And we have this located at the website at acservicetech.com, and we have a full outline and sample pages there. Hope you enjoyed yourself, and we'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.